the first thing we'll do is um, I had a quiz from last time. Uh, This and uh, circle the radius. Okay. Well, let me draw a primitive picture of this before I do something better. So, if you have a circle radius R, there's lots of ways you can set a rectangle in there. Do it like this. And you can also do it like this, or somewhere in between. Any guesses as to what the maximum rectangle special property it should have? It should be a square, right? Because notice that this one and this one are almost the same, right? So it grows from the thin one and then gets back down to the thin one in the other direction. Seems like it ought to maximize right there when it's got equal length, right? That's what my intuition was. So let, let's try to see what we can do with this. So here it is. Better picture. Oh. There's my circle. I'm going to put some rectangles. Now, notice let's call this a point XY. It's on a circle. This point completely tells me what the area of this rectangle is. Because this link right here, Y, and this link right here is X. So the area of my rectangle is, can somebody tell me? What's the area of the piece of that rectangle that's in the first quadrant? X times Y, everybody agree with me? And how many of those little pieces make up the whole thing? Four. The area should be four X. Uh, Another way to think of this is the entire height of the rectangle is 2x, the entire width is 2y, 2x times 2y is 4. Everybody okay with that? Here is what we want to maximize. And we have the usual problem that we seem to always have to be what is my problem? I got too many variables, right? I've got x and I've got y. Uh, but fortunately for us all, I have an equation that relates. All right, this way. So I get a new and improved formula here. This is what we're trying to maximize because here's oh and I forgot my four. There we go. Four X Y. Now what's an important thing that we need to do now? Well, right, but before that it That's right. What's our playground? Right. What values of x are appropriate for this problem? Okay. How small can I make that? Well, the way I've got this set up, I think I can make it zero, right? When that zero is just that horizontal line. And so it could be zero. How, how big can I make? What's the other extreme? R, 
because now if I squeeze the rectangle up here, X is measured from here up to here. And I'm digging on this because this is the easier type and see that this is a continuous function on the flow plane. Now that I've got all this down, I've got a function, I've got uh, appropriate uh, range for X. It's probably a good time to take the derivative. So this is a product rule. The derivative of X is one, so this is four times that, and plus four X times the derivative of this thing, which is one half X, one half of R squared minus X squared, the minus one half times the derivative of what's inside. And I'll clean this up just a little bit. This is four R squared minus X squared one half. Uh, this is canceling at minus four X um, times R squared minus X squared minus. Actually, I guess that should be minus four X squared. One, two, X. Well, see, this one half cancels that two, right? So you minus, yeah. Now, I'm going to pull out an X R squared minus X squared minus one. Here, that's going to leave me with an R squared minus X squared is one. And here, that's going to leave me with minus four X squared. Uh, Minus one half, four minus eight x squared. And I will put what I have four r squared minus x squared minus one half times r squared minus two x squared. And I like this because it makes it fairly easy. This one is minus R and R. That's going to make that R to the zero, right? Uh, and uh, one of these is, I don't need, which one do I not need? I don't need the negative R because it's not in my acceptable range. And out of this, I get R over the square root of two and minus R over the square root of two, which is what I get when I set that equal to zero. And again, the second one is out of the range. Notice one of my third fourth numbers, R, is actually also an in. Yes, Can you explain. It? So this is where I was going after the show is how did you go about doing those variables? I think what's confusing is I can see that was right. That's the first one, right? Because that'll give me a zero in the denominator, so to speak. Okay, when I see it, I can hear it. Is that clear? Nielsen. The other one I get. 
but a little bit complicated. This means x squared is four squared over two. So x plus or minus four. Then I see that. Right. Everybody with me? All we're going to do now is plug stuff in. So, A, I got to plug in the endpoints. <coughs> These are both zero. Because if you put them in this formula, we we'll plug in x equals zero, you get zero, x equals r equals zero. And there you go. And also, if you think about it, well, this is the one that's a little bit interesting. X is R over square root two. R squared minus R squared over two. So this is actually four R, uh, and this is this is also R over two. So, yes. Okay, do you understand either one of them? Right. R, the other extreme, is sort of up here. Here's your XY now, right? See how I'm getting skinnier and skinnier? Um, oh, right. So when I'm getting skinnier and skinnier, X is actually going to be zero. Right? And when I'm getting shorter and fatter like this, now your X is getting closer to R. So my extremes are way up here and way flat down here. This one gives x equals zero, and this one down here gives x equals one. Yes, it does. So what is the R? What the That's the equation. Right? It's Pythagoras' theorem. Because if you measure, if you measure any x coordinate, y coordinate, this is the radius of turn x squared plus plus squared. Others. Okay, we're almost at end game. So R over two. Gives maximum. R of the square root two gives max. I did say describe right. What is y? Y, this equation right here, is r squared minus x squared one half, which is r squared minus r of right two squared one half, which is r squared of two one half, which is r of right two. So I have x equals y and the rectangle. Does the x coordinate and the y coordinate have to be the same, which means that the shape is actually square? Any questions? Okay, so let's go through the cylinder. The cylinder one is actually, even though it's higher than it's actually, in my opinion, a little bit easier. Okay, so let's take a look at the volume. 
We'll get a can inside a sphere. Find the largest cylinder that fits in the can or the sphere of radius. And by largest, I mean largest with respect to volume. Well, this picture is complicated. So let me look at something. Let me look at something easier. Let's look at the cross section of this. So I've got this sphere, a sort of guillotine down the middle, right? And look at what's inside. Again, I kind of get right back. Right? Because when I cut the can, it gives me the right thing as well. And so, again, we'll call this x y. And the circle, since the sphere had radius r, the circle had radius r. So this is x squared plus y squared. And again, this length is always all like straight as a circle. And notice if you look at this right behind here, this one gives you the equation of the circle because this distance right here is the y component. And this distance right here is the x component. So basically, this, this circle is getting all possible primes x squared plus y squared. Now, the trickiest part of this is figuring the volume. Let me draw a companion picture of what the cylinder looks like. The way I've got this label my cylinder has a radius of x and a height. Uh, actually, what, what, what's the height of this cylinder? Well, right, but in terms of uh, what I've got on this picture. Well, let's we'll see what the, it's actually from here to here. That's the height of the can. Everybody agree with me? And what is this in terms of what I've got there? Like, not y squared, you know what I'm Not one y, but two of them. Right, so so the volume of our cylinder should be uh, pi x squared. There's the area of the base, the circle, on the height. There is the volume of my cylinder. Now, what kind of problem do I have? Too many variables, right? Not x and y. Okay, what equation am I going to use to relate them? Well, x and y sit on the circle, right? So, there we go. Means this. Now you got two choices. You can solve for y, put it here, solve for x. Which one is easier? I would actually go for solving for x, right? Because you've got an x squared already. I don't have to take square root of it, right? I can solve the line, keep the problem that way, but then I get this pesky square root, which is obnoxious. It'll work, but let's go this route. 
X squared is R squared minus Y squared. So let's just shut in for X squared. In this case, this is actually two pi r square one minus two pi y. Either way, it's important. I'll plug that out. I like it. hopefully a little bit. Of this is my equation for y. Now, what do I need to do? What's a good move at this juncture? Play around for a How small is the model? It could be zero, right? It's the world done the cylinder, which is flat today. Y could be as small as zero. And the other extreme, if I make this taller and skinnier, how big would Y be? So let's take the derivative of this. So it looks to me like now remember that I don't look at r squared fully, that's just a number. So this is two pi r squared. And the of this is my line. Now this is never any time, so we'll set this equal to zero to find the critical numbers. And the interval from zero to r. But that's my playground. And so I get six pi y squared is equal to two pi r squared. So you have zero to solve y squared, y squared. This is actually different than the problem of square. And we just had the square inside the circle because I got y squared plus two. This actually has to be a little shorter and flatter. I got two roots to this. And this one I can kind of keep it. So it's not going to get close to this. Now check out what we've got here. If I put in zero or R, Y for this, so zero and actually that makes it clear that you put in Y equal R equal zero because that makes it clear. B of R of radical three is equal to two pi. It's going to be R squared. R squared over three. And that's R over radical three. So this is actually this piece here is two thirds r squared. And so that's two four pi over uh, three by three. And this is bigger than zero, so this gets a match. And so, what do we get for our maximum here? Well, just to kind of describe this, I get y is equal to r over the square root of 3. And x, well, this is the square root of r squared minus y squared, the square root of r squared minus r squared over 3, which is radical 
two thirds. So uh, R is like, that is the X coordinate is radical two times what the Y coordinate is. Of course, the total height is bigger because it's twice the Y. Okay, any questions? Yeah, so keep practicing these steps. Uh, I'm going to ask you a, a couple more optimization and impulse based quiz, and maybe a small one for this. So, The theme here is using calculus to approximate. I'm telling you, if you're a scientist, if you're an engineer, uh, sometimes you need numerical results. Very often you do. And very often your numerical results are not going to be exactly perfect. You need to have an approximation. And with a good approximation, you need to have a way to sort of be critical of your own approximation. Is your approximation too big? Is it too small? How close is it? All right. Um, four and six, we're going to deal with ways to uh, approximate incomes of functions using something called uh, linearization. Four and eight is Newton's method. This is a technique that uses calculus to find roots of uh, uh, functions. So let me start off with uh, what I'm going to call linearization. Linearization is a fancy, fancy word, right? But really, it's there's not much to it. The idea here, first of all, these are basically synonyms. These are basically two sort of different ways uh, of approaching the same sort of concept. The idea is using. To approximate. Now, sometimes this works really well. Here it is. Let me give you a couple ideas. In fact, let me take one large function. Here is kind of basic. Suppose I and suppose I change my export a little bit. I want to know if I change the export by this much, how much if I change the y So for example. Suppose you know how much money is in your bank account or how much your stock portfolio is worth, right? So I know that my stock portfolio is worth whatever it's worth Tuesday at noon, right? 
I want to know how much my stock portfolio has changed, say Wednesday at nine in the morning. Right? I want to know how much I got a certain amount of money Tuesday at noon. I want to know how much that changes. Now, the way the stock behaves might be very volatile or it might be kind of smooth, whatever. But I want to be able to find this for my stock example, this delta Y is uh, how much your money is changed. This delta Y is good because it's positive, right? Delta Y is negative, maybe you start to worry a little bit. And the idea is this function, by the way, you might know what the formula this function is. It's a joke. No way. I mean, I have no idea. I probably don't even have it, right? Uh, I could approximate it, but who knows? Um, the idea is, Use this function might be extremely complicated. You can look at the one right now. In changing the x coordinate from a to a plus delta x, plugging that in might be difficult. So, for example, that's a simple function, an old friend. So, I asked you that. What's that? What's that? Harder. Everybody agree with that? Okay. It's harder to do. I mean, you have to compute this. It's complicated. It's just making it look beyond A. Probably close to A, but not A. And maybe this function is very sensitive, right? Uh, Maybe you want to know exactly what that change is. The idea behind uh, linear notes is this. Doing the change from 2 to 2.0 to 736, that's hard. At this point, it's complicated. But figuring out how much the change in line changes is easy. Notice. I've drawn the tangent line here. The y coordinate on the red line is probably not exactly the same as the y coordinate on the black function. Okay? But it's close, right? It's so close, I, it, it, they're almost kind of smeared together on my board, right? And so using the red line to approximate how much this function changes, well, that might be a good way to estimate. Okay? And that's the whole idea. Now, is this always a good idea? Not necessarily. Notice the tangent line approximates this function pretty well at this point. The tangent line at this point does not do very good. I agree. I mean, on a very small microscopic level, it might do pretty good. Right, but I mean, out to here, it's already way off base, right? Whereas here, because of the flatness of the function, it's a better approximation, right? So, the approximation, how good it is, how long it lasts as far as being a good approximation depends on the curvature of the function. And there are other problems too. <laughs> so, here's kind of a quick question for you. How good is the tangent approximation, tangent line approximation right there? <laughs> Not at all. You got the trick question because there is no tangent line right there because it's all between this, right? So there's, there's that problem as well. Now, of course, with a lot of the problems that you see in homework, it will be a pretty good approximation, right? But you have to be careful. Notice right here, tangent line approximations are probably pretty good over a pretty long stretch, right? Here, tangent line approximations in this little really, really muffled part, tangent line approximations are probably pretty good, but over a much shorter interval, right? Um, and notice tangent line approximation right here. I draw the tangent line here. Approximating the function from say here to here is probably pretty good, right? Smaller than what you get down here. Now, 
tangent line approximation right here. It's pretty bad, right? I mean, again, if it's super microscopic, it's probably okay. Okay, this is the whole philosophy. Yeah. So given this, I can practically just give you a point, but I'll do a slight bit of derivation. Suppose I have a function, and I'm assuming that at the point A, F of A is differential. A, A, and uh, now, the idea is this function might be super complicated, but perhaps I can get the tangent line to approximate the third one because it's easy to plug into the line. It's more complicated than this. Well, fine. That's a f of a, and again, like I said, assuming that it's differential or that. Okay, this is a blast from the past. This is old school. What's the tool that we need to find a tangent line to a function? We need two pieces of data to determine a line. We need a point. We need a slope. Or you might say, well, you need two points, but that's equivalent, right? Because two points means you've got one point and you can use the two points to get the slope. Okay, got a point. Look, I'm halfway there. What's the tool I need to get the slope? That's the derivative. So Well, is F prime of A. Everybody agree with that? <laughs> so if, if this were like a 1040 problem, this is okay on the, the tangent line here. Here's what I do. I put this in point slope form. Y minus F of A is slope times X minus A. Okay? So again, in 1040, I'll say, okay, well, look at that. I've got the tangent line. This is F of A plus F prime of A X minus A. In your book, do a little fancy about itself, and I'll have to do this. Is this is the linearization? Of f of x and x equals one. So definition L of X linearization of F of X at X equals A is given by F of A Second so the problem of A. Uh, L of X is just the tangent. 
to y equals f x at point a f x. That's it. So there's really nothing to do. And again, the whole idea, and I'm going to take you back to that problem that was made, made up. I'll show you that part of this. Approximate f of x, which may be a complicated by l of x, which is only a line, and so easier to keep it. That's the whole idea. Now, again, there is the important question of, okay, what is linearization of good approximation? And I'll oh, do an example. So let me give you here. Use linearizations to approximate. I just put this problem up on the board earlier. Right? I asked you all here, of course, probably the appropriate function is f of x is equal to x cubed. Right? And I asked you, I said, okay, hey, what's f of two? And it, you all just barked at me, oh, it's x, right? Because you put two in, you cube it, that's, that's not too bad. But we hesitate to do this, right? Because it's a complicated process, right? And if you think cubed is bad enough, the model's going to use like 15 power, right? Nobody wants it, right? So what we need is we are going to here's the idea behind almost all these linearizations. I don't know this. If I knew this, I would just write it down. Right? But I did know what F2 is. It equals A. I know what the value of the function here is. And in some sense, the word 2 should be reasonably close to 2.007%. Right? So I'm going to use this 2 as sort of my anchor point. So I'm going to get the tangent line. Two is close to 2.00736. So use tangent line at uh, 2a to approximate. So this reduces me to finding an old fashioned At the prime of x, what's the derivative of x cubed? x squared, I agree. And so, see, we need f prime of 2, which I guess is going to be the 12. And so, I get a linearization here of F of two, set prime of two, six minus two. Let's see. This is eight plus 12 times X minus 10. And I'm going to clean this up a little bit. Get 12 X uh, minus 16.
Now, uh, so we assume that Lx is approximately equal to Fx, which is x cubed. So L of 2.00736 would be approximately equal to 2.00736. Uh, now, what is this? Well, this has got a simple formula at 12 and 7.007. And I'll save you the time of actually having to multiply this out. Uh, 12 times uh, 2.0076. Is equal to twenty-four point oh 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 oh. I'm sorry, oh eight oh eight eight minus sixteen. So I get eight point uh, oh eight eight. Uh, actually, well, my calculator gives me for this one computer. Uh, actually, well, let me, you know, it's predicted for me. Uh, I've got an answer. It's just 12 times this minus 16. Right? There's my approximation. It's too big or too small. You're correct. How do you know that? Nice. Very nice. Why do you place a cube with something like this? Why? And so I use here's the point two a. And I was looking for a scale. Here is 2.00736 length. And what did I actually use to get this? I didn't use the black function, I used the red pen. So actually, what I got is this is the number I got. Which is higher, the point on the function or the point on the red pin? The function is higher. So my estimate should actually be a smidge too low. And actually, what I get uh, on my calculator is, is I get 8.0086. Uh, so it doesn't disagree until this does. So, and this is actually kind of an estimate that you can get if you go to field because multiplying this number by 12 is much easier than D. Yes. Doing the you okay here? No, so how did you make that? I don't know. Well, because my, this is just tangent, right? So, were you okay to that point? This is the tangent line point A F A. Because this is the point slope form of the line. Y minus Y coordinate is slope times X minus X. And then what I do is I solve for Y. And that Y is exactly what it is. 
Nobody will touch you. Okay. Let's say uh, square root of say two hundred. I'm going to come back to this. Okay. Um, you know, if I'm going to use a linearization, I'm going to have to find a tangent line. And if I'm going to have a tangent line, I need a function that is tangent too. What function might be appropriate to use? Your clothes. I love square root. Now I need a point. So let me ask you this. Does anybody know something reasonably close to 254 where I know the exact answer? Right? So for example, I know exactly what the square root of 100 is, right? But can I do better to make it closer to 254 than 100? 100 seems pretty far out. 225? Oh, that's a that's a good one. 225 will you can do better though. I think you can get a little bit closer. 225 is 15 squared. How about Square root two fifty six is sixteen, right? This is actually power two, so it shows up a lot of new something. Okay, okay. Okay, we're going to find the two. Square root and use it to approximate. Do this, I need that problem of that x. So I guess it's one half x to the minus one and a half power. And I need a slope. So this is one half um, 256 minus one. So that's 16, 1 over 16. So I get 1 over 32. So my LX is F of 256 plus F prime. I'm the x minus which in this case is going to be 16 plus 1 over 32 times x minus 6. And I guess this is going to come to, let's see, 1. 
take subdivision one from the thirty two tax plus ten. So this is so this part is like this. This is, by the way, uh, 254 plus 256 over 32. So let me uh, reproduce this way. Um, that's a uh, 500. Uh, hopefully, there'll be a method for my at the moment. So, this is 254 over 32, and this is 256 over 33. This comes to like 510, which is 512 minus 32. And the reason I do this is I'm painting like this as. Uh, The so five twelve over thirty two is actually a six eight minus one over six. That makes it easy. Yeah. One over sixteen is point zero six two five. Yes, so the question about your health insurance. Yeah. Uh, you had LT before this was before the 32. Mm -hmm. It looks like you tried to get rid of your fraction, but you multiplied 32 times to get 6. Right. Why did you do 32? Well, the 32, so when I plug in X, I get 254 plus 32 plus X, correct? Yes. This step is getting the common denominator of 32. Right. This over 32 plus six over 32. I, and then I, I rewrote it so I can subtract it off. Yeah, my thinking was like you multiply by 32 to get a size of the No, no, I'm finding a common denominator. And this, this approximation is 15. My estimate too big or small, which this one is big, too big, and I'll show you why. It's the same tangent time. What's the function I'm looking at? It's the square root of x. That's the function that I use, which is something like this. 
this thing flattens out tightly. I that's probably a bit of an exaggeration, but we knew what it was at 256. This is 256, 16. And we tried to use this to get what it was at 254 and not the scale. But if you can see here, the tangent lines are a little bit above the function. And so that approximation should be a little bit too big. The actual answer should be a little bit more than that. Or I'm sorry, the actual answer should be a little bit less. Than that. And what I get here is I get 15.9373. So it's a little bit. So this, this estimate is actually too big. Okay. Any, uh, any questions? Okay, I'm going to do linearization again uh, from a slightly different point of view. It's called differentials. Actually, I like differentials a little bit better because it's more easily usable. It's actually equivalent to this, they're all the same, but it, it's more easily usable for percentage change. How many of you ever had a chemistry either in college or high school? Did you ever have to write up your experiments? And did you ever have? To talk about your results in terms of percentage error. Right? Okay. Differential sort of allows you to do that a little bit easier, in my opinion. Um, I'm going to give you the point of view of differentials, and you will see that this is the same thing because the differential is also a use of a tangent line. I'm just kind of doing it. Uh, okay. Idea. Find change in the line of these kind of facts as X goes from X. I'm going to use this notation here. Delta X means a slight change. That group button. How many of you have seen it using calculus by the right fellow group button? There's a chain. So, uh, in this differential, uh, this is kind of sloppy when we do it in a little later, but for right now, I'm going to use these two stops. This both means a chain. X delta Y is actual change in Y equals that of X. So that's the actual change in Y point. And DY is our differential. I'm going to draw you a picture of this and you'll see why I say this is the same thing as change of line. Because it is. Here is the, and, and let me also point out these changes, this delta x, I know I wrote plus delta x, I want that confusion. Delta x itself can be positive or negative. I can move x up, move x down. So suppose. Function here. And I want to know, I want to somehow measure how this function changes. So this is actually measuring the change. So here's an X. And I want to measure how much this function changes as I go from X. X plus delta X, which I've written positive here, but it doesn't have to be. So my actual change in the exponent is that. I change X to X plus delta X, and that distance there is how much I change, right? What I want to get out of this. Here. 
this distance right here, this is delta y. Delta y is the honest to goodness, wholesome all American change in delta y. It's an actual answer. But maybe it's complicated to figure out. So here's the team to find. This right here. This is what we're going to call D1. This is the actual, this is the approximated change. So this is the point right here on the function x, uh, x plus delta x, f. The y coordinate changed exactly this much. That entire vertical distance is how much the y coordinate actually changed. The blue distance is what the tangent line approximates. So notice that the blue distance is the function actually increased a little bit more than the tangent line did. Does the function grow? Right? Everybody okay? Now, notice if you look at this picture right here, this is dy. And this is the change in x. If you look at this picture here, this vertical distance dy divided by this horizontal distance dx, what does that signify? It looks like a rise over one. It's the rise over one of what? Five. That's exactly right. This is slope of blue line. Right. And the slope of the blue line is at the time of x because the blue line is the tangent of the point of x. So this is where this comes from. So writing it in the notation that we have now, we have this. And the idea is. This, I hope, over a short span at least, is a good approximation of the actual change in line. This approximates uh, the actual change in line, which is still. Again, this is exactly equivalent to this. Uh, how good is this approximation? Well, it looks pretty good if you try drawing. However, if I extend the blue tangent line down here, it looks like it gets worse and worse as I go off to the left. And if this trend is to be continued, it will get worse and worse as I go off to the right and left. Okay with that? So, what does it mean? Differentials. Square root of uh, Okay, we just did this problem. I'm going to do differentials. It's a slightly different point of view. Uh, and I'm sure we get uh, a different angle. So we know square root of 256 is 16. So 
So if we let f of x equal x equal to m, um, and anchor point, that is the point on which we know, 256, 16. So, um, I'm going to assume that the change in function from 256 to 16 is quadrant by dy with z comma x and x, which is one half x minus one half uh, in ten. Now I'm approximating the change in my y coordinate by this thing one half x minus one half. I'm going to need, I'm going to remember, I'm going to need the value for x and the value for the x. What do you suppose I should let x be? X should be something where you can actually evaluate this. It should be our anchor point. Right? My anchor point is 256. Where I know value comes from. What is my dx? How much do I change that 256 to go to the place that I'm curious about? You're close. What do I have to change 256 by to get to 254? Got to change it by. Negative two, right? I've changed that to go to the other direction. Negative. So my anchor point is 256. That's where I know the answer. I'm going to change that by negative two because I want to know where it's going. Let's see what this number gives us. This gives us one half 256, the negative one half. Negative two. And this turns out to be negative one over sixteen. So change approximately negative one over sixteen. So estimate is F. 256 plus the change y, which is 16 minus 116. And that was actually this one came out in this. So instead of plugging into the entire tangent line formula. I found out how much it's supposed to change and then tack that on to the 16 that I have. Any questions? Any questions? Okay. 
Here's one. Um, you measure uh, the radius. The four thousand. Now, this is this question. Let me make sure this question is a little bit off because the earth isn't a perfect sphere, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. It's not a perfect sphere, but I'm idealizing it. So, you measure the radius for it, you find that the, the, the radius is four thousand degrees uh, with an error. Um, plus or minus two miles, right? I mean, you all know you're engineers, scientists. Whenever you make a measurement, there's a certain amount of uncertainty, right? So you measure the radius of earth, and you're good. Okay, you measure it to be four thousand miles, but eh, it's off a little bit. It could be as much as four thousand two, and as little as thirty nine ninety eight, right? Use this measurement. Uh, and of course, you use this measurement to compute the surface. Use differentials. To estimate maximum cost. Well, you've been passed. Maybe you need to know the surface area of the earth, but you need to know how much land we can farm and how much ocean there is, whatever. So you measure the radius of the earth to be 4,000 miles. There's an error of plus or minus two miles. So I can use that one 4,000 miles to figure out what the radius of the earth is, or to uh, figure out the surface area of the earth. But there's an error. You, you might have been short, you might have been long. And I need to know how much of an error it could have made. So how are we going to do this? Well, the first thing you all need to sort of, by the way, does anybody know if you have a sphere of radius R, the area, the surface area of this, anybody know what it is? We need to drive It's the square of the radius of the four pi. I'll give you the surface area. Okay. Now I'm going to use differentials to estimate how much error I get. Notice, by the way, I know what the answer to the surface area of the earth is because. See, all I, all I got to do is put in 4,000 miles here and square it, multiply by 4 pi. So I guess that'll be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So it's like 16 million uh, times 4 pi, right? So that's like number 12. So um, it's like, like maybe 190 million miles. But how much more? Well, here's the idea. Uh, I'm going to use differentials to plus. Now, let's just use our differentials form. DA is 8 pi R DR. What I do. And we want to estimate. 
maximum value of the change in A as R varies uh, in range 4,000 plus or minus two months. So I'm using 4,000 as a measurement uh, for my error to be plus or minus two miles. I want, if I make this sphere grow a little bit, it's got a bigger surface area. If I've got to make it shrink a little bit, it's got a smaller one. The change in area as you go up and down, that's your maximum error, right? This is hard to compute, right? So you compute this with 4,002 miles, you compute this with 3,998 miles, you evaluate both of those, find the difference between what you've got here. That's okay. I want to estimate this. I can do it much easier, almost. So if I use this approximation, okay, I need to know some values here. To be able to use this, what do you suppose R is? Four thousand. That's the number I need. It's the radius that I measure. Well, I got four thousand miles. Uh, what's the DR? That's right. It's the two miles that I made. It's a little change now. It's the two miles I might have missed. Five. Right I'll see. Change this property to A, which is eight times times four thousand uh, miles times plus or minus two miles. So this is thirty two sixty four. So I get 3264. So let me see. We've all worked this way. That's 64,000. Uh -huh. This is about, you've got an error, a max nice error. I'm estimating your error, I can tell you that. About 201,000. 062. Square miles. That's your, uh, that's my estimate. I'm not sure I got that. So this personal measurement radius, you use that to the person, and they can miss by, looks like about a little over 200,000 square feet. Let's have a vote. Should we terminate this person for being an incompetent verbal is, is, is this Is this good or bad? Right, missing by 200,000 square miles. Seems like it. Let me ask you this. See my little coffee cup over here. But if I told you, I can estimate the amount of liquid that's put in that cup, and I can get it within three cubic miles, you would laugh at me for being an idiot, right? Because how about one cubic mile? Thank you, man. Now, if I told you I could measure the entire volume of the universe and have an error no more than 15 miles, that's a different story. Right? This is the importance of 
sanitary. Yeah. Let's let's see how bad this is. So, uh, what is the relative error of this measurement? Well, the idea is, uh, do you remember how, how you did the, uh, what, what did you do in the chemistry lab? Theoretical minus experimental divided by theoretical or whatever. So the relative error here um, is, This is my measured value. This is A with 4,000 plugged in. And this is the actual change of the air, right? Again, I'm a lazy, lazy man. So let's do this. Here I'm using differentials again to approximate. Now, what's my DA? I can put the numbers in. But you know what? Again, I'm lazy. So I'm going to put in the letters here DA. Is eight pi r dr, and a is four pi r squared. And actually, I'm going to get a bunch of stuff canceling out. So the a over a is equal to uh, four pi. Okay, so here is eight pi r dr over four pi squared r. And this is my estimate of my relative error. Let's see that. 8 to 4 cancels down to 2. The pi gone. dr over r. <laughs> Am I okay with it? Much easier. And now I know what dr and r are. So this is 2. What was dr? Plus or minus 2. Well, what was all my measured radius? Four thousand miles. Miles cancel out. Of course, I get some human. I get plus or minus one part in a thousand. The relative error is actually one tenth of one percent. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I spent many frustrating lives in high school and college. I was always happy when my error wasn't in double digits, right? This is freaking good, right? The 200,000 is very deceptive because the area of the error is quite large. This is actually a pretty small error. Okay, any questions on that? Yes. How did I get that? Uh, by plugging in, so we had eight pi r, right? Which and the r is four thousand miles. I'm the r and the dr, which is the change of two miles on the initial by. And let's see if I did this right. That's going to be eight times eight is sixty-four, three zeros and a pi. So I think that. And actually, I should have written. I should have written. Right, it's 64,000 pi, and then I put that in my calculator. Okay, any questions? Okay, we'll talk more about this in the new perspective next time. I have to take up your quizzes today at 10.15 because my wife's bringing my daughter here. Don't worry, I will have office hours. Just be patient, it takes a minute for me to get back. If you haven't come met, met with me about the exams, we'll do so today. Uh, any questions? Start with All right, so let's do that.